very sorry that you have to listen to this for the amount of time. I am going to truncate this to get you out of here and not listen to me as um, quickly as I can. And if I falter, my colleague Steve Paddock is here and he will step in. Um, I would also like to introduce you in the room to R.T. Brown, who is the manager of this program. Um, R.T. is the person who is um, the font of all wisdom, so definitely um, see him as such. I'm happy to pass the torch on that. This is, if you want to know that you're on the right plane, we are going to the Bahamas. Now, um, please fasten your seatbelts. Um, I do wish I had the kind of humor. I love flying southwest with the people. I flew southwest a little while ago, and this guy, the guy stood up and he went, the, he went, wallet, anybody's wallet? <laughs> and he went, okay, good, now that I have your attention, that was my wallet, but these are the safety issues on this plane. It was very funny. Um, this is the Wikidip, the Wyndham County Economic Development Program Business Loan Application Workshop. Some of you in this room have already gotten an accepted letter of intent. Congratulations. You've, um, you've passed hurdle number one. For those of you who haven't done this process yet, this is still a mandatory. If you do get an accepted LOI, um, this is a mandatory class. So check. You've already done it. That's great. We will take care of the piece of notifying the Agency of, Commu of Commerce and Community Development that you've taken this class. Um, last time there was a form that needed to be filled out and we're going to take care of that piece for you this time. So that's check done too. <clears throat> At this point in this process, you are now going into VITA's loan application process. VITA is the Vermont Economic Development Authority. They have been chosen by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to dispense the loan portion of this fund, of these funds. So you're actually going through a regular VITA loan process. There are two loans that you can apply for once the LOI has been, the letter of intent has been accepted. My guess is that 99% of people will fall in the regular VITA small business loan application and some of you might fall in to the entrepreneurial loan fund um, application portion. I'm going to recommend that the first thing you do before you start filling out either application, once you have your LOI ex accepted, is to call Steve Greenfield at VITA or if you're already working with Vita, I know that one of the people in this room is already working with Marie. She already knows which application you should fill out. But you want to work with someone at Vita throughout this process because in addition to our advising, the Vermont Small Business Development Centers, have I said who I am yet? My name is Deborah Budrio. <laughs> I'm from the Vermont Small Business Development Center. I am the advisor for Wyndham and Southern Windsor County. And my colleague, Steve Paddock, is working with me on the Wikidip project in this area, and he's also doing advising. I would really advise you to take up the advising um, through this process, because any loan package development is always complex, as you will see. Vita's loan process mirrors most major bank applications. So if you've already done a bank loan application recently, you're probably going to be able to go check, check, check on most of these boxes, and that will be fantastic. But if you haven't, then you're going to be doing this from scratch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out the Vita small loan application um, so that you have it. And I'm, what I have done for you is created a checklist which you can use throughout this process. So, and then at the end, I'm going to give you the checklist and the application for the entrepreneurial application. And again, I'm going to do just the business loan application, the major loan application in this class because it covers all the components on the entrepreneurial side, so there's no reason to make you sit through the entrepreneurial one. If you indeed can do an entrepreneurial loan, you'll just have a tiny bit less work to do, not substantially less. So here's the loan application, and Steve, here's their check. Can I have one back, please? 
and here's their checklist. I'm also going to give you um, the, I'll pass them this way. Here are, uh, you've gotten these once before, but I'm giving them to you again. Here's the revolving loan program terms and conditions. They're standard, um, they have been created for specifically for this loan. So the loan rate on this loan, if you go on the website for Vita and you get it all confused about the loan rates, don't these loan rates that I'm handing you now apply. So it's 2% fixed for the term of the loan. It's a minimum loan amount application of $25,000. It's a maximum of $350,000. Um, if you are eligible under the entrepreneurial fund, up to 90% of the project can be funded by the VITA loan. If you come under the regular application, which again, I think most of you will fall under, um, it's 60% can come from the WikiDip fund and 40% have to come from other sources. They are looking for term loans on real estate. Um, that's 10 years, um, but it's amortized on a 15-year basis. Machinery and equipment loans will be a maximum of seven years, amortized on seven years. And working capital loans would be a maximum five-year term, and it will most likely be amortized on just five years. Loans will require collateralization if you're a nonprofit. And there are some nonprofits in this room who are going for the loan application. Some of the personal stuff will not be applicable to you. Um, and when I hit that point, I will say, don't worry about this if you're a nonprofit. Um, but you will, collateral will be secured by real estate, business assets, personal assets, or some combination of those. And they will consider all of that in the process. Once you go through the entire VITA loan process and they come back with a yes, you are eligible and can be underwritten on their regular loan terms, they are going to send a one to three page synopsis back to Fred at the Agency of Community at the ACCD and he will then review it one more time to see if it fits within the Wikidip um, entire program. He will not be seeing at that point your entire financial picture. He's only going to be seeing the fact that you have been underwritten. So at this point in the program, <clears throat> the, the personal and business financials of your business are now private. So he's not going to be seeing that information and I know that was of some concern to some people so there's no concern about that. But he will get a one to three page synopsis from Vita saying either yes, it can be underwritten or no, it can't be. If it's a no, it stops there in terms of the Wikidiv process. Um, if it stops there at that point, it means that in general, the loan is not fundable um, because Vita again is running along the same lines as most banks will. Um, so then we have to go back in and dig and Vita will be very clear with us about why it wasn't and we'll try to fix whatever those problems are. Um, if it can be underwritten, then he'll get this short synopsis and then you'll hear from the ACCD. Fred will give us a yes or no um, in terms of the wiki dip and then we'll go back through the process and that's when RT and you know the whole grant management piece will come in know that there will be very specific grant agreements and loan agreements written that will take into consideration some of the extra just sort of reporting functions that will have to be done around this money. Um, but again, we're going to let those be individual, individualized, and so I'm not going to address any of those concerns today. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, so on these loans, what kind of interest rate are we looking at? So 2%. If you are in the Vita loan, the regular business loan, it is plausible that in the other 40%, Vita could come in on their own as a funder. So, and that would be more at their, whatever their typical rate is. Um, so they could be part of the package that meets the rest of the 40%. 
VITA is the Vermont Economic Development Authority, is not federally regulated. They do have underwriters who are, you know, usually, you know, all of those people are bankers and they're lovely people and they're fantastic to work with. VITA themselves does not lend directly to people only by themselves. They always come in after a bank, so they're usually part of a package, so they're used to being part of a package, so they are open to coming in and saying, because the funds that they're managing are the Wikidip funds, they're willing to come into a program and you know in, in a, any one of your applications and say, yes, there is a piece of this 40% that we would be interested in funding through our regular program as well. Again, in some combination with a bank or your own personal investment or whatever. So it's good to have a relationship with Vita always. Um, they are fantastic people. We at the Vermont Small Business Development Center always put them on our list of lenders to call. Um, their people are fantastic. They have a new person on, on board that's been in lending in Vermont for a long time, Sam just changed um, jobs and so Sam Buckley has now joined their team and he's spectacular so they've got a great group of people and um, we've worked with them a lot too because after Irene they came in and did spectacular things really quickly so um, so let's take you now have the loan terms in front of you I am simply going to go so what I did for you was I took the business loan application, and I created you a four-page checklist. If you can check off all of these things, you will be done. All I did was try to make sense of a standard loan application, and lots of people love checklists, myself included. I've given you, um, uh, and the top important emails, mine, Steve's, RTs and Steve Greenfield at Vita. Again, Gary's going to ignore that and just deal with Marie. Um, if the box is gray, I probably should have done a different color, but I didn't want to use up printer ink. If the box is gray, it means that it was additional information that was not required in your letter of intent. So if it's a white box, you should be able to just go to your letter of intent and yank it out and put it now in the right order. <clears throat> Again, this is a business document. This is no longer a creative, it, none of them should have ever been a creative writing exercise, but this is a not a creative writing exercise. When we review this, if you put in adjectives, we are going to take them out. If you tell us you're the best, greatest, most spectacular, we're going to take out best, greatest, most spectacular. And we're going to get down to what you do. If you have awards, if you've been given a national award, put that in the appendix. That's where you can build up in the appendix any information that you want them to know about that increases your credibility. But do not say it yourself. So you want this to be extraordinarily simple, as direct as it possibly can be. Don't try to design it, use, you know, Times New Roman, 12 point, you know, single spaced or single, you know, single and a half. Just don't, this is not the place to put your, you know, in the business plan competition, I would see somebody who always did this. Every business plan competition, somebody got their children to draw the front page. That's adorable on your Christmas cards. <laughs> it is not adorable in a bank loan application. It does not help. So. Business, business, business is the, you know, is the name of the game on this one. So I'm just going to, I am not even going to look at the application because I looked at it 62 times now. I'm just going to go down this. So it's in sections. Do not staple it. Do not put it in a three-ring binder. Do not um, do anything fancy with it other than binder clip it at the top because for the underwriter, they're going to have to take this all apart and Xerox the portions that need to go to the underwriter. So if you make them take it out of beautiful sleeves and Xerox, don't do any of those things. Again, this is not, you know, this is not a thesis or your college, you know, your senior project. This is a business application. So just chunk it all together and um, 
you know, put it in order by section. You can put a piece of paper in front of it if you want that says section A, section B, but you can mostly fill in their application and just answer the questions and then if there's additional information, you can say there's additional information. First page, just your standard business information. They want a couple of things that weren't in the LOI. They want a business fax. They want your federal tax ID number. They want your number of employees up front, and they want the year your business was established. Year business is established is always about long-term credibility and sustainability. So um, the other day I saw something that on the front of this package it said, um, it was this sort of old-timey package. Someone was showing me a, 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 a sample of something that they were looking at buying a display box. And on the front said it was for a pizza. And again, this was just a sample. But on the front it said established in 1990, like in this old-time type. It's like not that long ago established in 1990. And then on the back there was a picture of their grandparents who said they brought this recipe 74 years ago when they, you know, it's like, well, then use that date because that actually makes it look old time. Anyway, so if your grandparents started this business, use that date. That looks good. Um, if you don't have a federal tax ID number, um, then we've got other, we, then we need to go back and deal with that, but most, uh, hopefully you do. Um, you will have gotten your um, DUNS number and your NICS code for your letter of intent, so you're just transferring those over. Um, in the ownership section, this is one where the nonprofits will not do. You will just put NA across that, so N slash A across any section that has information about private ownership. If you are um, if you are privately owned, this should be for any any owner at this point. So anyone who has any ownership needs to be listed here. Later there will be places in which personal financial information will be due, but that's on, on a certain percentage, and I will note that when I get there. But here is, they want to know what the percentage of ownership is, but if somebody, if your mom and dad gave you, you know, $10,000 and they own 1% of this company, you need to put them down. This is the place where you don't hide anything. This is the place where truth telling is the most, the smartest and wisest thing to do. Um, so you need to repeat that information for every owner. So that can be an attachment. Obviously you can't fit every owner in this ownership section. So you just continue on another sheet as you need. Now we get into the real meat. We have section C, which is the loan request and collateral information. So they want the amount of the loan that requested. The loan term requested needs to match those three loan terms that I said in the beginning. 10 years on real estate, seven years on machinery and equipment, five years on working capital. So if you know if you have multiple ones, I would just put their, their multiple match the requests and just you know they'll see it as they go further. But if it's one, stick it there. A description of the purpose of the loan. If you have written something that you think you can pull from the LOI, you can certainly take some of that information and stick it in here. But what is this, what is this loan going to do for you? What is it, what are you buying? What are you creating? What are you making? What are you doing? Again, short, sweet, to the point. If it's got multiple things, I suggest every single time in a business document, you just go, the purpose of this loan is semicolon dot, 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 dot. Short, you don't even, you know, one word, two words. Again, this is not a creative writing exercise. Um, and then if there's a listing, of, if you are purchasing assets, a detailed listing of the assets to be purchased with the proceeds. So this isn't, I want to buy a stove. This is, I want to buy a six burner professional gas range. Here's a picture from, you know, here's, Here's the, here's the name of the model that I'm looking at, and here's the price. Now, are they going to hold you to that specific thing? They're going to ask you why you didn't buy that one, but, and, they may, and they might, in terms of a loan, come back and say, 
well, you bought this one instead, so you don't need that much money, and you don't want to ever borrow more money than you need to borrow. But you need to be very specific. This is the place where you show that you've done your homework. Um, so you can't be just vague. You can't say, I want to create a restaurant kitchen, and it's going to cost $150,000. That's not going to fly. So detailed listing of assets. So I would do the name of the, the equipment, the, maybe the manufacturer, you don't need to go to model number, but price range, you know. And then if you are asking for working capital, what are you using it for? Are you using it for advertising? Are you using it for um, employee salaries? Are you using it for, you know, website development, which would of course come under marketing? Are, what are you using the working capital for? And again, how much of the loan is going to that portion of working capital? Um, vacation to the Bahamas for rest and relaxation and research <laughs> is not qualified. I can assure you that won't pass. Unless you take one of us and then maybe we can figure out how to learn that and you know, we can figure out another way to do it. Because this is a combination loan and not all of your loans, um, and with VITA always, this will be always in a VITA application, where are the other sources of funding coming from the project? So what is the other piece that's going to make up that 40%? Or if you're, in some cases, I know that this is a much smaller portion of a much bigger process, you're going to have to explain the whole process. They want to see, they want to know what portion of the funding they're providing and where they stand in the um, in the tag you're in lineup of how they get their money back if something happens to you. So Vita is always willing to take second position. Does everybody know what I'm saying when I say second position? So banks, you know, when you line up a series of funding sources, who's on first is important. And that's usually negotiated between those people. Um, Vita is always willing to take a second position, which means if the bank, if you if you default, the bank gets it first. The you know Vita gets it second. You know somebody else gets it third. Whoever wherever that falls. So they want to see, and they also want to see who else are the partners they're going to be working with, and how, what others. And if you can't be completely funded then this project isn't, you're not going to get this money anyway. So if you don't have assured sources that make up the other 40%, you're not going to get this anyway um, because they're not going to give out money to people who are still waiting for other modes of funding. So part of this process for you guys and getting this application done is getting the other funding sources lined up and approved or at least on their way to approval. So um, the cash equity, able to invest by the applicant or others, um, again, in the nonprofit world, this doesn't account, this, you know, you guys are going to bring in um, capital campaigns and those kinds of things under other funding sources and, uh, you know, how solid those are is going to have to be talked about with your individual loan advisor from VITA and what documentation they need on that they will let you know. Um, in terms of other um, for-profit businesses, if again, if you have a private investor, you know, that's where this can come in as well. And, you know, if your mom and dad again or, your, you know, your family is giving you money and it's coming in as cash, then that's where you need to be, you need to be clear about who that is and what they're giving you. And then the collateral information, what can be collateralized? What do you already have that can be collateralized? And what on the asset list can be collateralized? So um, in some cases, the collateral, if you have a building, usually the building can stand as most of the collateral for itself. Equipment, they're going to take the equipment list, and they're going to look at it in terms of the tables that they have. And they're going to make their own determination about how much of that they're willing to, to take as collateralization. Um, restaurant equipment, what do you think right now? Auction price? Yeah. 10 to 15. 10, 10 to 15% on any kind of kitchen or restaurant equipment because the market's flooded with it. So they're not going to give you, they're not going to say, I can. Brewery equipment, they're loving brewery equipment right now. You can probably get 90% 
and brewery equipment. Um, so it really depends on where you are and what you're doing specifically. Okay, section D, this is all new from the LOI. This is where the pedal meets the real metal, I guess. This is what we do all day long. So again, we encourage you to use our services if you haven't already. And this is the, this is the narrative section of your plan. So you need to do a description of the business and the product or services that you produce or provide, including the size and character of the past, present, and future markets. This is one where you can't skimp on this. You need to have as much detail as you possibly can about your markets. Um, and then this is where you start talking about your competitors and their market share. Now, how much do you know about this? As much as you can possibly get. Um, your principal customers. If you have, you only have to do your top five. You don't need to do more than that. I mean, if you've got 10 principal customers, you can give them 10, but they want the percentage of your sales represented by your top five customers. Why? Because if you have three customers and the top person has 95% of your business goes to that one customer, they're gonna worry about your long-term viability. What happens when that customer goes away? <clears throat> Now, it could be that you truly do have someone who's 95% of your, your, product, your, your customer base and you've got a 15-year contract with that person. Then I would say, yes, this is true, and here's the copy of our 15-year contract with those people. So that contract goes longer than the terms of your loan, so everything's fine. Just be aware of where a bank, and think of Vita as a bank, is going to be worried about your information. When people come to us and say the bank didn't understand us, they didn't understand my application, we say, whose fault was that? I mean, we're pretty tough when we come to this part because it's your fault, not theirs. If they don't understand your business, it's because you haven't done a good job explaining it. It's not because the banker isn't smart or they didn't take the time to read it. It's that they read it and they still don't get it. So make sure that any place when you do this, you go, oh, I wonder if they'd have a question about that. With any bank loan application, our goal is always to get them to have as few questions as they possibly can have by the time they finish the entire application. They can go, yes, everything's here. It's all done the way it should be. This looks great. What does that also go to? Your credibility, which is a huge factor in lending. So. Um, the internet is a great place to do research. Um, we're constantly having people go to um, you know, the census reports. The census snapshots are one of the most amazing things you'll ever grab off the internet. You know, it will tell you who lives in Wyndham County, how, many, how, how big the household is, what the household ownership is, what the, the, the um, household income is, um, you can get some amazing information off the census, and the new census figures are up, I think. So, you know, and do you know how much your principal competitors have of the market? No, but you can make some educated guesses. So, say it's an educated guess if there's not a lot of research. If you have anything online that you are selling and you do not have Amazon as one of your major competitors, that's a big red flag because Amazon is a competitor to everyone who ships anything over the internet now. Um, the week that I was at home with this, and you're going, I wish she was home now. Oh God, I wish this was more home in bed. Um, I looked at Amazon Handmade, which is the new section of Amazon for artists to sell their handmade products. It's already massively populated. It's just opened and there were already 1,700 jewelers on it. You know, by the end of the month, there's going to be another 1,700. By the end of next year, there's going to be 100,000. I don't have a single small artist who's not going to have to consider Amazon Handmade. Do they want to? Probably not, but they're going to have to consider it. It's kind of like saying, you know, I'm going to ignore the fact that this, you know, 50-pound behemoth is in the room. It's in the room. 
So, but if it's so flooded with so many, it's still in the room because you know what happens? People go and they check things. I have a friend who has a website who sells products, and she knows this happens. They go to her website, they look, they keep that one open, they open another browser, they hit Amazon, and they go in and they type her product in. And if it's cheaper and they have Amazon Prime, Amazon gets the order. Sorry, it's just what's happening. Shipping. Free shipping and usually cheaper. Now, does she make a lot of money on her Amazon product? No, she doesn't. So she's found over the last three years that if she can match Amazon's pricing and give free shipping, she, can, she gets the orders. If she doesn't, and this is a person who's on national television, does a lot of relationship marketing, still doesn't matter. People are feeling stretched and tight, and people feel stretched and tight they shop. And if you see the, you know, the new economic reports, people are still feeling like we're still in a recession. So that's always going to be people's go-to. It's sad, but it's true. Okay, so you want to do that. Your principal suppliers include names of the individuals to contract, contact advertise addresses and phone numbers. Why do they want that? In case they start feeling iffy, they want to find out what your, are you paying on net 30? Are, do you have a lot of, you know, they're going to call a couple of people and say, how are these people as, um, as customers? And it, what is your competitive advantage? Why are you better than anybody else at what you do? What's your advantage? Their, your marketing plan, what's, if you have a sales force, what's the organization of the sales force? If you're the sales force, then that's who, what you are. But how do you have a distributor or how do you distribute your product? So. You know, if you're, a, if you're a product, do you do it just, you know, at local farmer's markets? Are you doing it at local farmer's markets plus co-ops? Are you doing it at local farmer's markets plus co-ops plus local restaurants? Are you also selling it on the web yourself? Are you, you know, are you retailing it yourself, you know, in various places, in, in pop-up stores? All of those things go into this section. I have a distributor. You're, you know, if, if you're, there are some companies in this room that only can do it by distribution, and because there are laws around it. So, you know, who are those people, and how long has your relationship been? And then, how do you? What is your advertising and promotional strategy? You know, how do you sort of do what you normally do? Your production plan. If you're if you're producing things, what your capabilities are. Um, in terms of production management and scheduling, your inventory control and quality control. What is your present production capacity and how will the project increase your production capacity? Um, in the case of someone in this room, it's going from a certain size staff that you already have to a bigger staff from a weekly situation to having to populate a daily situation so it's how does how is the internal management team going to handle that process um, so you want to make sure that they know that you've addressed the fact that you haven't just said this loan is going to allow us to double sales and they drill down into the thing and there's no there's no you have not addressed how you're going to actually do that or you can say we're only at 50 percent capacity now and this money is going to buy us more raw materials so that we can utilize the current capacity at 100%, then maybe, you know, but again, you need to be clear about what it's doing. Um, and what's your QC? What's your quality control? Do you have any? Please say you have some. Um, I went back one. Um, the discussion of the availability and price of key raw materials. Vita is very smart on this one because we've been dealing with value-added food people in Vermont for a long time. So if you're in food manufacturing, they're going to know if you say you're using all organic, you know, non-GMO products, that the fluctuation of your product stream is going to vary because, you know, I'm making this up, but organic coconut you know, oil costs one price today and one price tomorrow, and with the availability. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago when we had a really bad maple syrup season, and I had several clients who were scrambling to find local maple syrup. So what is that? Just, you know, again, either we know how to handle this problem, we have alternatives for it, but here's, here's, where, they, here's where I source them from. 
And if I'm dependent on any one source, here's how I get around if there's a problem. So again, you're talking about you understand how to run your business. And then are there contingencies for future expansion or contraction? I'm either going to get bigger or I'm going to get smaller. Outside of this loan, you know, this is what's happening. You know, I, I had a customer come to me a couple of uh, months ago and had retired up here from somewhere else from a big job in retail in New York City and decided that maybe they were going to take their retirement fund and buy a store, buy a location. And my first question was, why? Just why? Just tell me why. Why would you want to, at this age, buy, spend this money for this? If you're going to tell me that your children are coming up to take this over as a legacy business, okay. But if you're telling me that you're just bored and you're creating yourself a job and you don't care about, because by the time you want to re retire again, you don't have enough time frame from here to there to make back your money and make enough of an initial profit, additional profit, to make this business saleable again quickly enough to make your money back. So why are you doing it? So you, again, Vetus, if they get into the depths of this application with you, may ask you those kinds of questions. And that's not when you want to be going, um, <coughs> I hadn't thought of that. So think those things through. Um, they want to see your management structure, including your key personnel and your, their functions. They want to know that you know how to run your business, who's in what, you know, who's in, there's a book called The Right Seat on the Bus, who's on the bus and are they in the right seats. Um, any terms of your trade credit, um, if, you put, if you have to put here all of everything comes to me COD, um, you better have an explanation of why that is. Um, and then your business location, including consideration of the labor pool, transportation, utilities, and expansion possibilities. So um, if you are saying, I'm going to expand, is it smart to expand where you're expanding? Is, it, is the labor pool going to be there for you to expand? Um, RT and I were talking the other day about someone who was looking at bringing something into a place that needed massive internet structure and, and support systems, and it wasn't there. And it could have gotten there, but the cost of it was going to be prohibitive. So, you know, have you looked at everything that you need? If you work with me, I have a little thing called does it have legs, and one of the, one of the um, questions I have on the location is can, it, can the biggest truck that delivers to you get down the driveway? Why? Because I had a client that didn't test that, and when the trucker came to deliver the stuff, they couldn't get down, so they had to come up with a team approach to taking you know, forklifts out to get stuff out of the truck and then take it back down. And you know how much truckers love that? Not at all. Why? Because they get paid on distance and time. So anytime the trucker has to stand outside your facility while you figure out a, a, you know, a workaround, so literally think of everything when you're looking at a space. Um, and that's what they want you to consider here. That's what they're looking for. OK. Business financial information. Much more, here's where it's much more complex than the, um, than the LOI. Um, you need to have all of your historical financial statements. You need to have tax returns for the last three years. You need to have income statements, which are your profit and loss is the other term for that, for the last three years, and balance sheets for the last three years. You need to have your current financial statement. So at any point that you do this loan application, so right now if you were doing this loan application tomorrow, I would tell you to pull year to date to November, the end of November. You don't have to pull to the middle of December, but you have to pull to the end of the previous month. Um, and you want profit and loss and balance sheet. If you have QuickBooks, that's going to be easy to do. They'll take both of they'll take that platform. If not, you're going to have to get your CPA to pull what you need to have pulled. Then they're going to need projections. They're going to they're going to want an income statement, profit and loss for two years, and a balance sheet for two years. This is where they want you to be really specific. We suggest, if you're using QuickBooks, that you take your QuickBooks profit and loss from the previous year, export it into Excel, and build the projections off of that. 
and, and then in the comments section of Excel, capture all of your assumptions. So I'm assuming that we're going to open this new facility, we're going to, so sales are going to increase by this percentage point. Why? You need to note it again. This is how bankers, if you ask them, read business ap loan applications. They usually read, and Vita doesn't have one, but they usually read the executive summary, which is the first page, how much we're asking for, this is what we're asking it for, this is who we are. They skip immediately to the financial section. They drill down on the finances, and then they go back and they read the narrative. If there's any disconnect between the narrative and the numbers, that's where they stop. If there's a disconnect, sometimes they don't even look past it. So you need to make sure that everything you've described in the narrative is completely explained in your numbers. And you want to restate. So as you're doing your projections, always, always capture your assumptions. We assumed that if we build a new training facility, we are going to be able to increase training classes by this many. We assume that we are going to have this many applicants in each training class based on the fact that right now in this facility we have, you know, we're at 90% capacity, we can't get any bigger. Here we're going to move, we're going to have a lot more classes. We think we're going to be at 50% capacity the first year, 75% capacity the second year. Do not make assumptions that have you at 100% of your capacity in the first year because they won't buy it. Banks are extremely conservative lending institutions, and Vita is included in that. So if you think you're going to impress them by saying we can triple sales next year, make sure that you actually can back that up and be, make sure that that's really conservative. If you work with someone like Steve or I, we're gonna cut that back and make it more conservative. Because again, if you exceed those, yay, you can buy us all champagne and we will come and drink it with you, we promise. Um, we'll even buy the champagne and come and drink it with you. But you need to make conservative, realistic projections. And in those boxes, and if people don't know how to do it, we'll show you how to do it. You want to capture those comments because they're going to look at them. They are going to drag their cursor over that box and they're going to see why you made that determination on that number. So that's how, how clear and specific these projections need to be. And you need to make sure that if you've asked for money to increase production, it shows in not only your revenues, but your cost of goods, or whatever the cost is of performing the service that you're going to perform. So you need to make sure that your revenues are correct and the resulting um, you know, expense categories are correct. So anytime you increase sales, your cost of goods sold is always going to go up, whether it's hiring new instructors or more reporters or getting more raw goods, you know, grapes or, you know, whatever you need to create the product that you're creating. So if you have sales go up and those numbers don't go up in relationship to sales going up, they're going to go, you don't know what you're doing. So we're going to look at those projections. And Steve and I, if you work for us, will really, we'll really go in there with you. That's what we do. That's why banks like you to work with us before you go in because they know we've asked you all of those questions 62 times over before you've hit their desks. Um, balance sheets are a little harder to do, but I, I would say throw your account in there if you can, or if you have QuickBooks, we can sort of play around with QuickBooks a little bit and try to help you get that. You, and then you need cash flow projections for at least one year, so, and that needs to be by month. So what is, what is my cash flow going to look like? And they know, they've been in Vermont long enough to know that we are a seasonal state. So regardless of whether you have a seasonal product or not, or you have a seasonal business or not, you are most likely have some seasonality to your, to your um, cash flow because you don't have people buying your service in this month, or you don't have, you know, most every business, when you say, I don't have many businesses that don't have some seasonality. We're much too seasonal here. So account for that. Um, 
and make sure that you know and show where. And if the working capital is to cover cash flow needs, then you want to make sure that the working capital that you've asked for in the beginning of the application matches the working cap, the cash flow need that shows on that sheet of paper. So if you've asked for thirty thousand dollars in cash flow, uh, you know, assistance in working capital, and the cash flows projection doesn't say that you need thirty thousand dollars, problem. So again, you're going to always be going back and forth between the information that you've given them to make sure it matches. A schedule of your liabilities. So not only do you need to give them the schedule of your liabilities, the list of who you owe, but you need to give them the name, the contact, the address, the phone number, the original balance of that liability, the current balance owned, and the maturity date of that. And then the current payment that you're making, and if it's a credit card or another loan, what's the interest rate? Um, and then you need a schedule of contingent liabilities. Contingent liabilities are a little harder. Those are liabilities that are promised if this project happens. So there are future liabilities that you will incur based on this loan application is the best way to describe contingent liabilities. So that's amounts that may be due and to whom and under what circumstance. So you want to make sure that you're thinking again in the future. For the nonprofits, this is an NA, but the personal financial information. So anyone owning more than 20% of your business must provide a current personal financial statement. One is included in the application. We also have one that's a fillable PDF. If you have a CPA, they can pull them for you. They should if you haven't done one for yourself. And you need a last year's tax return for each principal more than 20%. And you need a resume for each principal. If the principals are not willing to do this, we've seen this happen before, it will stop the loan process. So before you do this process, you need to go to anyone who owns more than 20% of your business and be sure they are willing to provide this information. Because if they're not, it doesn't go forward. Then there is a, a, an employee compensation and benefits form that's provided that you need in Section E to produce. And then there's some general information in Section F. Um, is this business a coke borrower or a grantor for any other businesses? Or inf inf So if your business has stood in for someone else's business and said, you know, we will back their liabilities, you know, what are, what are your relationships with anybody else? Um, if any of if the business or principal stockholder or affiliate or affiliate is party to any claim or lawsuit, explain it here. Don't let them find it out. This is one of those places where again truth is important. You know, if you have is somebody who is in either a bankruptcy filing or they've been in a lawsuit, um, you need to just disclose it. And disclosing it is better than not disclosing it. It won't stop the process necessarily, but if you don't disclose it and they find out afterwards, then it will, because then your credibility is in the, in the you know what. Um, you do have to say that it, um, at least 51% of the business is owned by a US alien, uh, US alien, <laughs> a US citizen or resident alien. Um, and are you a Vermont um, resident or not? Yeah, you know, or any of the principals, yes or no, how long you've been here. Um, if you owe any taxes for prior years, um, then this needs a, a really good explanation about why. Again, it may not stop the process, but you've got to bet if your restaurant or your sales taxes or any of those Vermont taxes or federal taxes are behind, Federal taxes behind is probably going to stop this process because this is federal. No, this isn't federal money. That's CDPG. It would have stopped that process. Um, <clears throat> are your payroll taxes, are your payroll withholding taxes um, current? Again, if they're not, an explanation and why. And are any permits required for this project? And if they are, they better be in place beforehand. They, you know, um, permitting is something that we know in Vermont can be an iffy and lovely and wonderful, fun situation. So they want to know what's required and where you are in the process. Um, so, you know, all of your, I I at this point of your project, you need to make sure, um, you know, that your, all of your zoning stuff is taken care of, your water and sewer, your, you know, that you're not building on an Indian burial ground, if you're a historic district that you've taken care of, all of those things, you know, that you're ADA compliant, the building process is going to be, that, you know, all of those things, 
need to be taken care of and need to be addressed. And this will happen with any bank loan application, so you're not going to have anything. Can I ask another question about sure. ADA compliance? Yeah. Nonprofit newspaper on the second floor, is that pushed aside because of that, uh, in case we want to do some new hiring? or Probably not. You'd probably want to ask before you go much further. Okay. ADA requires the federal law. It's kind of hard to get around. So, especially if you're going to get funding like this that comes to the state, um, it, you know, I think it's been fairly, uh, definitely on the grant side, it's going to stop it cold in its tracks. I, you know, whether Vita sees it as, I haven't, I haven't seen Vita let it go by before, but, um, you know, that's a call to Steve Greenfield and a call to RT to help you, you know, dig down that information. Anything that feels iffy. Before you start this whole, you know, don't get to section E, section F, and have, it, have done all this work. Because we're going to tell you always that any kind of bank application, any kind of application of any, is a business decision. How long is it going to take you to do this process, and what are the end results? So you want to make sure that you go through and, you know, one of the reasons to sit here and listen to me horse out this information to you is at least now you've gotten in your head everything that might be required and any red flag or any question like Dave just asked is a good one to ask at the beginning of the process, not when you get to that point on the checkbox. So I would, I would talk to RT and I would, I would talk to Vita earlier in the game. I know. Um, so, so our project going to be um, uh, design, build, integrated yep. project delivery, so all the permits will come afterwards, so we'll right. be contracting first. Right, but I think you need to at least say that you know what permits are required and they are on your list of things to do. You know, if you're going to do a build and you're not going to have checked with the town and you're not going to have checked with water and sewer and you're not going to have checked, you know, with those... You need, State storm water. Yeah, you need to make sure all of those certainly things... certainly list them. Right. You have you, to copies because right. they're not in place. So I would say these are the list of permits that we know we have to have in place. And if, Gary, if there are any major anxieties, like if there's not, um, I mean, I know where you're building, so I know there's sewer there, but say there weren't sewer out to where you're going, you know, what's, I mean, I just worked on a project somewhere else where that was the, that was the nail in the coffin, mm -hmm. was the price for sewer to get out to where they were was just prohibitive. For, for this one, the, the anxiety question was the new zoning. Right. Laws that went for that section right. of town effective October 1. Right. But, but we fit because okay. of the size of the lot. Good. So, you know, so just make sure that you've asked all the big, the big questions. Um, zoning is a big one. Water and sewer is always a big one. Um, wastewater. Wastewater. If you, you know, do any food product, you're dealing with wastewater. My breweries now have to, wastewater's been huge. Um, you know, does the town, and that's does the town have the capacity to handle the wastewater that you're producing? So, again, you just need to make sure you've got all of those things covered. Your insurance information, who's your agent, their telephone, their mailing address, and then a description of coverages. They're not asking you for um, anything other than a description of coverage. So you can provide the first page of your description or just have your insurance agent do a, you know, do a, an inventory of what you're carrying. Um, and I'm going to be adding a new one to everybody's sheet. I'm going to be adding shortly cybersecurity. We just had somebody get hacked and the Secret Service is now involved and it is quite stunning what's going on and, and, the, and the ramifications of this. And they did not have cyber cybersecurity insurance because it's just not something we talk about of very often. And it's going to cost a fortune to get out of this one. Um, okay, miscellaneous. If th these things are, if they're applicable, a purchase and sales agreement. So if you're buying a property, what does the PNS look like? Um, if you have equipment that you know you're going to purchase and you've already, you know, and you're in the process, what does that invoice look like? A lease agreement if you're signing for lease space or if you already are in a lease space they'll want a copy of your current lease agreement so that they can see what the terms are and if there is you know if you've got a lease that's terminating in a year and you're gonna have to move this whole facility they want to know that you know have you, and again I know that and here's the plan for me fixing that um, a real estate appraisal a partnership agreement environmental site assessment 
Any other information as may be requested by the lender and deemed necessary, and that you won't know until they go through the process, and they may come back and ask you for other things. There are some pieces that you need to sign. You obviously need to sign the completed application. There is a loan application certification, civil rights, and equal credit notice that's two pages that you need to sign. There is an environmental short form if applicable, and then there's an assurance agreement that's included that you need to sign. And after you've spent the 60 hours required to do this application, you can sign everything and send it in. And if you think it's going to take you less than 20 hours, you're living in a land that we don't know where you are living. Um, it's more a 40 hour to 60 hour process to do a complete loan application package for anyone. Um, unless, and you know, I know in one case in this room, they've already started the process, so they're probably further into the process than some of the rest of you. But uh, um, how many hours have you spent so far? Guess on the application process? Uh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. So environmental site assessment, will they want the, the, the phase one, it's like 80 pages, do they want that whole report? I would ask Marie what she wants. She may just need to know that it's on file. So again, this is why you call VITA. Um, in, in Gary's case, um, they already are, and I can use his name because they've done an LOI, it's been accepted, so their name is attached to it and that's online now. Um, they have already started this process and they've been working with other banks and so they're, for, they're somewhat, in, this process has been under consideration for some time. So they have some reports done, but they already have an existing relationship with Vita. So even though this is coming in under, a, under Steve, they're, they're letting Marie continue that relationship, which only makes great sense. Um, because Marie is one of the people who deals in this area for VITA a lot. But you want to have a relationship with VITA before you start this process because, again, they can help you through the process, we can help you through the process, um, and you know, just to make sure that you're doing it correctly. If you haven't done the LOI process, you need to watch the video, you need to get that certified that you've watched the video, and then again, you might as well come and use our advising services. We're free. It's most likely going to be Steve, who's much nicer and has a better voice than I do. Even on good days, Steve has a better voice than I do. Um, here's the, I'm going to hand, Steve's going to hand you out. This is the description of what an entrepreneurial loan consists of. Um, I printed it out for you. There's a couple places it's hardly readable because part of the website prints, but you can certainly see where the URL is. Um, and it talks about the eligibility. Um, this is more about intellectual property and non-tangible assets. So, you know, you guys might, I, I just don't know. It's why calling Steve Greenfield at this point is the best thing that the Commons can do at this point. Um, but here's the Vita, here's the loan description, here's the loan checklist for the, entre for the entrepreneurial loan fund, and here's the um, application for the entrepreneurial loan fund. You might as well all take one. I printed them out for you. And again, if you've done everything you need on the business loan application, um, this is shortened only in um, your projections only have to be for a year, but they have to be by month where the other ones can be annualized. So it's a little, it looks like it's a little less work, but it actually might be a little bit more work. Um, I'm not going to keep you longer than I have to keep you. I want to know if you feel like you have any other questions. Um, we're here. We have the room for longer. I, but I certainly don't want to um, make this any more complex than it already is. I hope the checklists help you. I would use the checklist in terms of whether you can dispense some of this information to someone else to create. Use this as a, you know, put their initials next to the box and then, you know, assign a date for them, give them a copy of it. You know, if something is going out to the CPA, note that it's gone out to the CPA and when you expect it back. And then, you know, use this as a checkbox and don't turn this application in until all the boxes are checked off because what you don't want to do 
is turning an incomplete application because then all that does is make Marie who, who, or whoever's been assigned to you at Vita call you back. It's much better to call her beforehand or Steve and say, I have a question about this or I need assistance with this. You know, I'm working with Vermont Small Business Development Center, but we have a question on this. We work really closely with Vita. We know them all really well. So again, you might as well use us as well. And we can review stuff if you want us to before. We have no capacity to say whether you are fundable or not fundable. What we can do is say to them that we've looked at the numbers, we've looked at the application with you, we've given it a once over, that's essentially all we can do. Um, that's all we can do in any situation, in even a normal advising situation. But um, they do like it because it does mean that someone else has just, you know, looked at your at your application and helped you cross the T's and dot the I's. My voice held questions. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate you listening to me like this. I'm sorry. It would have been so much worse if we'd done it two weeks ago. I would have been sleeping after.